Today's scripture reading is taken from Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 to 17. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in, then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put, up, he put the man when he had, whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which flows around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat, it, eat of it you shall die. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Thanks. So in chapter 1 of Genesis, we, we saw the very broad panoramic view of creation. And here in chapter 2, we're looking in a kind of zoomed-in, more focused view on God's creation and instructions to the first man as he placed him in the Garden of Eden to live with God and enjoy paradise with him forever. Now, speaking of paradise, when I mention the word paradise, what comes to your mind? How would you define paradise? What sounds like paradise to you? Well, maybe it's a place that has no pain or suffering. Perhaps it's a place that has no injustice, evil, death, and disease. Maybe for you it's more a whimsical, blissful place. You're reclining down on cloud number nine and there are angels playing harps flying all around you. Maybe it's, it's something like that. But I think deep down in our hearts, everyone is longing to be free from whatever is normal in your life. The longer you live life, the, the less naive you are to the reality of brokenness in our world and evil in our world. The more you experience that brokenness and evil, the more you're just wanting something more, something better, some kind of paradise. King Solomon put it this way in Ecclesiastes, he says, God has placed eternity in our hearts, just longing for something more, something eternal. C.S. Lewis put it kind of like this, if you have this desire that cannot be met by anything from this world, then the most probable answer is that you were made for another world. And this really gets down to the topic which I'm kind of addressing this morning is that God created us for paradise. He created us that we would know Him, we would have a deep, intimate fellowship with God. The Garden of Eden is the original paradise that God created for man to enjoy, to enjoy His presence and fellowship with God forever and ever. It was a place of extreme beauty and life. But we all know what happened. The first Adam, he lost paradise for all of us. And only through faith in the second Adam, Jesus Christ, can anyone have a hope of entering into this new paradise that God is preparing for us, for all who love Him. A place where God will rule and reign and give us eternal life. 
a place where there will be no more sickness, sin, and death. So this morning, here's my outline, creation of man, 4 to 7, the creation of Eden, 8 to 14, and life in paradise, 15 to 17. And my prayer and my desire is that we would run back to God in faith, faith in His Son, and experience this life of blessing that God has created us for. Let's look at the creation of man. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day of that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. This is the account. This is the genealogy, which is what this word generations speak of, of the heavens and the earth and how they were created. These are literally the offspring or the children of the heavens and the earth. And Moses has included this for us, this kind of heading, many, many times in the book of Genesis to help us kind of break down and understand that this is one section and there's going to be another section starting with another statement about the generations. This is also the first time we see in the Scriptures that the covenant name of God, all caps Lord or Yahweh God, is used in conjunction with the word God here, Elohim whom we've been introduced to as the Creator God, the the multiple plurality God, the triune God who made the heavens and the earth and everything in them. And we see something in verse 5 about the state of the world in those first couple days before God made man. God had made the land. It was all good. There was land, vegetation, the animals. It was good, but there was something still missing. The bush had not yet been planted on the earth. The plants had not grown up from the seed in the soil. God had not yet sent rain on the land. He had watered the earth, used this kind of vapor mist coming up from the ground. And the biggest problem of all that God states here is that there was no man to work and to cultivate the land. God's solution for, was for man to work, to cultivate, to irrigate, to make the land productive for food and nourishment. Man's first occupation there is exercising dominion over all the earth by being quite literally a farmer, one who plants fruit-producing trees and grains for humans to consume. And this is a lesson that God gave Adam, but also gives all of us. This is the world that God made. He is the owner. He is the boss, the Lord of all of it. But he has entrusted man, he has entrusted us to be stewards of managing God's creation. We have this privilege of managing the work of God, the the creation of God, the property of God. I want you to also notice here as we move on to verse uh, 6, 7, how intimately and how graciously God cares for and designs man. It says, then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth and the ground. Then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. This reveals to us how God made man on the sixth day. This word is that God formed or he fashioned man from the dust of the ground. The word formed here is the very same word that we would use for, for how a potter molds and crafts the clay into some sort of vessel for some sort of instrument. God formed and fashioned a man from the dust of the earth into a human body. If you think about Genesis chapter 1, this is so much more intentional in how God made man than how He made the animals. God created the other life by simply commanding it, and, and these animals just came into existence in an instant. But God took His time with man, the masterpiece of His creation, to form, to fashion it into a human being, a person created in the image of God. And after creating the body, God breathed the breath of life into His very nostrils. Again, this is so an intimately way of creating man, much more intimate than any of the other creation. This warm, face-to-face embrace, and God breathing his breath into the man's nostrils. I think this tells us that man must enjoy a very unique and special relationship with God. We are made in his image. We share his image and his likeness, appearance and character. 
but we also share the very breath of God. This word breath here, ruach, is, you know, you can be translated breath or, or spirit depending on the context, but, you know, God breathed His breath or He gave His spirit into us, and that is what caused us to become alive. It is the very breath of God, the spirit of God that very sustains our very lives. And after God breathed life into the man that He had made, man became a living human being, not just an empty body. But the point is not to tell us scientifically how all this happened and how God made man, but the point I want us to see is that God uniquely and intimately was involved in crafting and forming and breathing life into His people. God made man from the dust of the earth to rule over all the earth. But we know that doesn't last very long. It's because of our sin. The stuff that we are made out of, the origin that we are made from, becomes our destiny for our bodies as well. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And we're reminded of this even this weekend as we attended the funeral memorial service of one of our longtime members. The part of us that is made of carbon, that is made of the earth, it's going to go back to the earth. But there's also part of us that is breathed into us by God that part of us will go on to live forever. It will live forever in one of two places, whether in the blessed presence of God or in the judgment of God, and that depends entirely on what you do with the Son, Jesus Christ. Speaking of Jesus, do you remember the story how Jesus healed a blind man? There was a blind man and how Jesus, you know, he spat into the ground with a mixed kind of mud with the saliva and then put that onto his eyes and sent the man to go wash his eyes in the pool and then miraculously he was able to see. I think Jesus is doing something in that healing to kind of give us a throwback to Genesis chapter 2 to say, look, I am the very same God that created Adam of the dust of the earth. I am the very same God who can fix your eyes from using the dust and the, my breath and my saliva and the, the, the same God who breathed life into this Adam and caused him to live. Jesus promises that whoever will believe in him, whoever trusts in him will have a new and spiritual eternal life who will be able to live forever in the presence of God forever in the new paradise He is making for all of us. This is the creation of man. This is what we're made for. Let's look at the creation of Eden. The Lord planted the garden in Eden in the east, and there He placed man whom He had formed. And out of the ground He made spring up uh, trees that are pleasant to the sight and good for food. A tree of life was in the middle of the garden, and a tree of the knowledge of the good and evil as well. Now, remember back in chapter 1, we we learned God created man and woman in His image. He gave them the divine cultural mandate, the task to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth with the image and the glory of God. He also commanded us to exercise dominion, to rule, to reign over all the earth, to subdue it to make the earth fruitful and plentiful and and gather resources so that man could flourish as God's image bearers. Now, if you think of this astronomical task, it is a huge task to be given to just one person and later a second person. I mean, we're just but people. The earth is a very, very big place. So what does God do? Well, He creates a garden places man and then later woman into that garden that he had made. And in this garden, he is giving man and woman some on-the-job training so they, before they go off and take on the entire world, they get to first practice and develop and hone those skills in this kind of controlled environment, the Garden of Eden. All gardens need maintenance. We know that. Gardens, you know, are separated with walls and hedges of some kind to distinguish and create boundaries between the garden and the rest of the fields and the forest. Gardens take a lot of work. 
If you do any type of gardening at home, or if you looked at any of the gardening, you know, do you know how many people have to go cut hedges and mow the lawn and do all kinds of things to water it? There is a lot of work involved in taking care of a garden. Here Adam gets to put his fruit making and his exercising dominion skills into practice under the carefully watchful presence of God. The garden is where God gets to exercise and put into practice all that theoretical knowledge to exercise dominion and to and have practical experience in how to first manage a garden before you manage the whole rest of the world. We see God plants this garden in the east. He fills the garden with all kinds of beautiful trees and vines and orchards, many things that are good for food. So beautiful was this garden that many other passages from the Scriptures will use the Garden of Eden as the standard of beauty for comparison. Let me give you one verse from Isaiah uh, 51.3. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her wasted places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her deserts like the Garden of the Lord. This is a promise that even though Israel is desolate and, you know, on the verge of destruction and being attacked by the Syrians, that God will bring restoration and restore to, into great beauty like the Garden of Eden. So the Garden is a beautiful place. It is pleasant to the eyes to behold. It's also practical and utilitarian. It's a place where there is abundant food for Adam and later Eve. This garden presents an opportunity for a man to express his thankfulness to his maker. Now think about this. Adam gets to enjoy the fruit of all these mature trees that were planted by God. He never has to, you know, dig any holes. He never has to plant any seed, water the ground, and wait decades and decades for it to to grow up into a tree that can produce fruit. He just has to pluck anything he wants and eat of the fruit that God had made. God took care of all of that. He planted all kinds of abundant trees and different kinds of species of trees in the garden, all just for Adam. That's a blessing. That is His grace. Now, anytime we experience His grace from God, it should also cause our hearts to be thankful, to rejoice and to praise God and offer Him thanksgiving. This garden is a picture of paradise. A picture where God will have fellowship with His people that He created in a very special and real and unique way. It's a place where there is communion with God and fellowship and the worship of Yahweh in an unparalleled way in any other place on earth. I mean, this is where God will meet all of Adam's needs in the garden. All His physical needs for safety, for food and water and shelter are met in that garden all the safety and social needs of having the structures necessary for him to work and succeed at that work and develop his skills are all there. The relational needs he has, God will provide a wife for him, the perfect wife for him. The spiritual needs Adam has will be met by God who is present with him, who is walking and talking and fellowshipping with Adam in a way that we can only dream of. Next, we see there are two trees, two special trees in that garden, the tree of life, whose fruit had this miraculous ability to sustain life, physical life, spiritual life, eternal life. It's kind of like the first, um, what do you call it, the super food or whatever people call it that was so magical. It can heal your body. It can you know, de-age you. It will make death unnecessary. This was the fruit from this tree a very tangible expression of the life-giving gift and grace of God. If Adam and Eve had never sinned, they were never banished from the garden. They could have gone on to live forever and ever as long as they had access to this fruit from the tree of life. Now, this tree was so important and memorable in, in, in the understanding of the Jewish culture that even within the tabernacle and the temple, Israel was commanded to make these lampstands, right? And you might know them like the menorah. It's a lamp that has seven branches, seven branches and seven candle lights that symbolize the tree of life. 
you know, kind of points us to the idea that life can be found in having this worship and relationship with God. That's the tree of life. But there was a second tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This tree was a test, a test of man's obedience, right? And it, it, it gave the ability for man to determine for himself whether what is right and wrong, independent of God. Now, we have this kind of weird idea. We think that, you know, having independence is a good thing, <laughs> but that's not how God originally designed us. God created us to be completely dependent upon Him for moral guidance, for life. When we choose to say, you know, we want to have autonomy, we want to make our own determination, what is right for me, what is wrong for me, that is an act of acting independent of God. That is saying, I don't need God to give me the guidance. Instead, I want to choose for myself. And in fact, I want to be God-like and replace Him as the authority, replace Him as the source of everything good. For us to create our own ideas of right and wrong, is, it's a rejection of God and His Word, His revelation. It's really at the heart of sin is saying, I don't need God, I'm going to do things my own way. Now, when they ate of this tree, it also made them sexually aware. They felt guilt and shame for the first time. Of course, guilt and shame are the consequence of sin. Now, in the next couple of verses, you know, Moses tells us about these rivers and these, you know, these that flow from Eden, one that was going around and then split off into four. He tells us these other precious metals and gemstones that can be found in this area. And I think the reason why he's doing that is he wants us to see that the Garden of Eden was a real physical place. It was not just some imaginary fantasy, you know, imaginary thing in your people's minds, but it was a real place where God had real physical fellowship with the perfect men, man and woman that He had made. We were given some of the geography and some references to these ancient people groups, the one main river that flowed through garden that watered all the trees and then split off into four. And in spite of all these details that Moses gives us, Eden's location still remains a, a mystery to us. And I think post, you know, the flood that covered the whole world, all the geography is all messed up and changed anyway. So, but, you know, we do have four rivers mentioned. The Pishon flowed around the land of uh, Havilah, one of the sons of Cush. People think today that's around Arabia, but we don't have any idea where that is. There's gold, bellum, and onyx stones there. There's the the Gihon River that flows around the whole land of Cush. Um, Cush is thought to be uh, the father of the Ethiopians, so this is kind of Africa, south of Egypt, if that's correlated. There's also the Tigris and Euphrates, which are in Assyria or modern-day Turkey and Syria, Iraq area, and they kind of connect to each other before flowing and emptying into the Persian Gulf. But, you know, we don't know where this is. They don't connect in any way in our contemporary geography. But I think the point Moses wants us to see is the water's flowing through Eden. It's a picture that shows us this is where life comes from, right? We Later on in the Scriptures, we have this idea of the rivers of life becoming a picture of how God blesses us and where His blessings come from. Jesus Himself says in John chapter 7, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. For whoever believes in me, as the Scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, he said this about the Holy Spirit, whom the believers in him were to receive, for it's not yet the Spirit had not yet been given. But the living waters flow out of the heart in the believer. This is an illustration of what the Holy Spirit does in our life. He is the source of all new spiritual life. He creates it in our hearts for all who believes. So Eden, it's the perfect paradise. It's where God gives us life, where God sustains all that is necessary for us to live with Him. This is what everyone was created for to find life in God, to find all the blessings of happiness and rest, 
to be sustained fully by God. But let's look at what life is like in paradise. The very first thing we see in paradise in Eden, verse 15, is that God put man in this garden for, to do two things, to work it and to keep it in verse 15, to prepare it, to cultivate it, to harvest it, to be productive. Work is part of life in paradise. And notice this, that in the story of redemption, work occurs even before the fall, before Genesis chapter 3. Now, work in the kind of the most broad sense, it's just putting forth effort to accomplish some sort of task. We think of work as what we do to earn money, to earn a living. There's also a lot of work that's necessary in studying and to to get a degree, to graduate with something, a piece of paper. There's all kinds of unpaid work that is required to build and maintain your home and your family. You know, we have Saturdays off, many of us, but you know, if you have a house, there's always stuff that needs to fix. There's always lawns to mow. You know, driveways to shuffle, things that my kids destroy, I got to repair, and a lot of it is strenuous, more difficult physical work than what I would do during the rest of the week. You're not getting paid for it, but you're putting in work. There's also work that we offer to the Lord in service of Him and service of the people. My point is to show us that, you know, God designed us to work even in paradise. God designed us to be productive not lazy or idle. You know, sometimes even this work word uh, for work is uh, translated into English as service, as an act of worship. And this suggests to us that even work itself, there's a divine purpose for it that extends further than just earning money for yourself. Work is a service rendered to God. It's a service that's beneficial to others. Our work is one way that we can worship God. I know what you're thinking. Many of us have this tendency to think, you know, we don't really like work. It's hard. It's difficult. I know some people definitely hate work. People will want to live for the weekend, and thank God it is Friday. They dread Monday morning. That might be some of us as well. But it wasn't designed that way. Work is burdensome and onerous because of sin, because of the curse. Remember when that happened later on? God cursed the ground. He made what was expected of Adam and Eve, gardening and farming, and made it difficult. Instead of just, you know, gardening and things would just pop out of the ground, there were now thorns and thistles and weeds. You know, that's really the bane of any gardener's existence. I spend so much time. I even recruit my kids to come weed my own backyard because there's just so many. But I want you to see this. Before the fall, before any sin, everything God made was perfect and good, including work, including that the, the fact that we would all have some work, some service to Him. One way we reflect the glory of God as image bearers is to work. God worked in creation. We work in, in, in maintaining our, ourselves and bring glory to Him. Everything we do, especially our work, because that's what we spend most of our waking hours doing, needs to reflect who God is, needs to image and reflect His goodness to us. Now, spiritually, work you know, God created us to serve Him through work. It's one way we can worship the Lord. One of the ways we do this is in our attitudes, you know. This has great implications about our attitudes, especially when our boss is being, you know, cruel and dishing out the work, especially when customers are being extraordinarily difficult or our coworkers are just being unhelpful and not, you know, taking up their, their side, you know. Remember, remember this. God created us to work, and our work is rendered to Him as an act of worship, an act of service to God. God made us to work. Combine this with last week's message, God also made us to find rest in Him on the Sabbath. So together, you know, as we work and as we rest in Him and we have this rest-work kind of cycle, we may glorify Him and serve Him. Broadly speaking, this is a theology of work. 
God created work good. He created you also to have rest from that work and find your rest and your restoration in Him. Now, the second command God gave to, to man in the garden is to keep the garden. This word keep is about having watch over, to protect something, to guard someone or something. It's also involved in maintaining and guarding, protecting the place that God had created. See, what Adam was supposed to do as the guardian's uh, protector, his garden, was, the, was, you know, when there was that slithery, you know, lying serpent coming into the garden, he should have done something to protect God's garden from that slithery serpent. But instead of, you know, protecting and driving out that evil one that would defile and wreck God's garden, you know, we know what happened. He listened to the temptation. He sinned. He succumbed to it. Instead of driving out the serpent, they, Adam and Eve, were driven out by God. They had gone from being the perfect people to becoming somewhat evil, no longer holy. And there's application in this for us as well. When we work, we need to watch over ourselves as well. Watch over our families, watch over our church, so that we can maintain what is holy, righteous, and pure. To make sure God is honored in our lives, honored and obeyed in our families and in our churches. To protect it from any kind of evil or wickedness, any impure thing that would threaten us, threaten to do harm to us. Now, there's a spiritual application as well. We need to practically maintain our relationship with God. There is effort that needs to be put forth to fight against sin, to fight against anything that would defile us. There must be work that is put forth to keep ourselves holy and pure before the Lord. And when we sin and we keep these short accounts before the Lord, even though we succumb to temptation, we sin, we confess it, we turn from it and repent. We don't let that unrepentance go on for a long time because that will threaten our relationship with God and our relationship with others. We need to work hard also at creating and cultivating the spiritual disciplines, these habits and routines in our lives so we can find rest in God. We can have a deeper worshipful relationship with Him and experience more of God's presence in our very lives. See, we have a spiritual responsibility to keep ourselves holy and pure and flee from idols, just like Adam was supposed to keep God's garden holy and pure and drive out anything that would destroy that. Second thing we see in the garden in paradise is God created boundaries to protect His people. Verse 16 and 17, God commanded the man saying, you must surely eat from every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. God gives his people commands that we might obey them. And we might live under the umbrella of his blessings as we obey them. God set the boundaries for what man could eat and consume. Think about it, every tree he planted, they were all accessible. He could eat of any one of the trees except for this one. That was grace, you know. He did not plant any of those trees. He could consume any of it freely. That He did not plant or grow or put forth any effort in it. He could presume it. But even freedom itself, it doesn't really have a meaning if there's no restrictions, if there's no prohibitions. I think about it, if there's no restraints, then what are you really free from? And God here only gave Adam one restriction. There was only one tree that he could not eat from. God gave everything else as an expression of his abundant and loving grace. We have the one prohibition with the penalty. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat from it. The day you eat of it, you will surely die. This was the test for Adam and Eve in their obedience. But don't view restrictions and God's prohibitions as cruel. I mean, as a parent, we get this. 
You know, it's, God is not cruel to us. It's not cruel when we tell our children, don't run across the street. It's not cruel when we tell our child, don't touch the, the, you know, the, 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 the hot stove. You're going to burn your hand. It's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. Restrictions are necessary for our good and our protection. They're good for human flourishing. I mean, think about it. You know, like, would you dare drive in like India? <laughs> or would you dare drive where people don't follow the rules of the road? Would you even cross the street? Rules and boundaries are necessary for us to thrive as a people. It's good for us. And even more so when God gives us commands, it is flowing out of His good, abundant nature and care. These rules were designed by God to protect His people from falling into sin and certain death, for choosing to live independently of God. Because God made us to live under His protection, His care, His love, to have all our needs met by Him. This tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were never to eat from, lest they surely die that very day. And again, I told you, this knowledge of good and evil was the ability to discern for yourself, to determine for yourself what is right and wrong. And that it belongs exclusively, that right belongs exclusively to God, our Creator. God made us to live according to His Word to be dependent upon Him to tell us what is right and wrong. He is our Maker. He created us. He has the right to tell us what to do, just like a potter has a right to determine what he's going to make and what type of thing he's going to create from the clay. Everything God says and tells us is for our good and for His glory. All of His instructions, all of His commands flow out of His good and righteous and holy nature. God is not like many of the other fake gods that are cruel and manipulative of of man. He is a good God, a loving Father. So eating the fruit of this tree is really a declaration of war. It's saying, I want to be independent from God. Eating this tree is saying, I I, I don't want to live under God's care and protection. I don't need His rules. I don't need His word to tell me what to do. I am going to make my own decisions for what is right and wrong for me. I'm going to have my, my own truth, my own morality. I want to live life my own way, and no one can tell me otherwise. I demand to be independent of God, to be autonomous, to be self sufficient. And really all that is saying is that I want to be God myself. I reject His rule and His reign and His right, and I refuse to live according to His words and His commands. I want things my way. And that really is at the heart of all unbelief, at the heart of all sinful rebellion, is this willfulness and rejection of God and His word. Lucifer did this before the fall. God created him to be a magnificent archangel. And he was so beautiful that, you know, he decided, I don't need God, I want to be worshipped instead. I want to have my own way. Isn't this the same thing that Satan tempted Jesus with as well? You know, in the temptation to act independently of God, to not obey his commands, to, 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 to do things for yourself. I mean, you don't, why do you need to listen to God the Father? You are the Son of God. You know, just turn these stones into bread. Do it independent of God. Now, Adam will sin this way when we get to chapter 3. He acted independently of God. He should have at least very asked, you know, God, you know, I don't know about this serpent thing and what he's tempting me to do. What do you think I should do, God? Instruct me, teach me. But he acted independently. But this is something Jesus did not do. He refused to act independently of God the Father. He submitted himself to his Father and to God's word. And the consequence of the sinful rebellion and disobedience is death. Physical death, I mean, was not immediate, but it started that day when Adam sinned. Adam was made to live forever, to be sustained forever by God, you know, through that tree, but, you know, they were banished from that garden. They could never eat from it. And yes, Adam did live until he was 900, 
But 900 years is is a, a blip in time when you consider eternity. That's what we were made for. There was spiritual death, the the immediate consequence of eating from that tree. That began right away. The relationship he had with God and his wife immediately was tarnished because of sin. The perfect relationship that the perfect man had with the perfect God was no more. The relational intimacy he had with, with Eve, being naked and ashamed, was no more. The sinful nature, the curse of death that is passed down to all of us, all of Adam and Eve's descendants, except for the second Adam, Jesus Christ, born of God, who came down from heaven to save all who would believe from death, restoring us to a new paradise, what the Bible calls the new heavens and the earth. But for all who will not believe, there is this third reality of death, eternal death what the Bible calls hell. This is the ultimate consequence of Adam's unbelief, of Adam's sinful rebellion, the reality that hell awaits for all those who do not believe. So though God commands us in different ways than Adam, though we have much more commands expansive through the rest of Scriptures and what we are to do, The basic choice is still given to all of us. Will you obey God? Will you submit to His written Word? Will you believe and surrender to the God, the living Word, Jesus Christ? And in doing so, will you find life in Him? I mean, will you choose to repent of your sins and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ so you can escape death, eternal death, and receive eternal life with God in His new paradise. Your faith in Jesus Christ alone is the only thing that can bring you back and restore that relationship that was lost with God. Your faith in Christ is the only thing that will lead you into paradise. And look, it doesn't matter, you know, where you are right now. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past, how much of this fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you have been consuming, so much of how much of your life has been lived independently of God, in rebellion to God. It doesn't matter what kind of wreck that you find your life in or how much guilt or how much shame you might have right now. What matters is today, today, will you turn from all of that and put your faith in Jesus Christ? And have all the sins of your past wiped away and cleansed forever. That is what Christ came to do. And if you have trusted in Him, if you've been cleansed by Him, will you live in a way that is reflective of that? Will you be thankful for what He's done? How He gave His perfect life that you could not live for you how He died on that cross, the death that you deserved, how He was raised from the dead to give you life that you could never have on your own. That must move your heart to be filled with thankfulness. And this grace that you have received must now fuel and motivate you and stir you to live for Him, to work every day as an act of service and worship to the Lord. You know, to take breaks from that day to find your rest from your work in Him. This is what God created you for, to find your sustenance for Him, to serve Him and to worship Him with all of your life. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for Your Word. We're thankful for what You created us for, how You intimately crafted us and made us and shaped us and gave us life, gave us Your Spirit. Lord, we ask that you would help us to remember what you have created us for, not to live for ourselves, not to live in in, in rebellion of you and to act independently of you, but help us to see the good intentions of following your word and following your will, listening to your commands, and to see how much blessing there is in following after you. We thank you for us, for giving us Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross. 
that how it was through one tree and its fruit that led us into sin and damnation, but it is through His death on the cross that has led us and restored us back to You. Help us to taste and to see the greatness of a life lived in faith in Your Son. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.